Good morning. Please turn with me to Mark 2, 13 to 17. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at his table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were, reclin were, re were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him, and the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to the disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus heard it and said to them, Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Okay, kids, anyone ages four through second grade, you are welcome to go right out this door off the Children's Church. The rest of you welcome to our neighborhood as we are in the fourth Sunday of a series on loving your neighbor. Glad you're here. You can see we are in the neighborhood, and we're going to consider together the text that was just read. Uh, we do make use of the YouVersion app, and we encourage you to go out there. If you go to YouVersion and you go to Events... Uh, all the, the notes are there, quotes, you can take notes there, and we encourage you to make use of that, and we're glad you're here. Special welcome to the Gibson family, as we're going to move this morning right from our service to a memorial for Larry, and we invite you to stay for that after the morning worship service today. We're going to watch a video, and then we will move right into our study of the text. When I became a Christian, I was also still very deeply rooted in the lesbian community. I had just broken up with my, with my lover, but my heart was not in it at all. Um, I was uh, the, the faculty advisor to I don't know, four or five student LGBT groups on campus. Um, like most research professors, I had lectures to give and classes to teach in queer theory. Um, and, and quite frankly, when I first became a Christian, I was terrified because I fully expected the elders of my church to be standing in the back of my 300-person uh, feminist theory class you know, with placards like the kind I used to see at gay pride marches. Um, and I was really terrified about this. And what I was really surprised by about Christians was that they gave me the grace to work out my relationships. And they understood that I was not a blank slate and that this wasn't going to get all cleaned up in a day. My pastor and my elders and their wives and my friends in the church treated me like a person who was working but, but was not going to get all cleaned up at once. And the other thing that really amazed me about, about Christians was that they were, they, were, they were almost, I don't know, they were so sensitive to the fact that I had lost something that I valued. You know, nobody said to me, well, pff, Rosaria, that was sinful. Let's, you know, let's move on. Nobody said that at all. I mean, people knew that, that my, it was a sinful relationship, but my, my ex-lover was an image bearer of a holy God, and she did amazing things in the world. And, and, and I was really going to not only miss her, but miss the, 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 the house that we had together, miss the, our dogs and our dishes and, and the view of the lake from the window. I, I, I lost a lot, and, and I was amazed that my, my Christian friends knew that, that they, they, they grieved with me. I was also amazed at how kind my, my Christian, my, my new, my, these Christians were to the people I had left behind. I was amazed that they understood that they lost more even than I did. 
because they didn't have union with Christ. They didn't have the hope of the gospel. All they had was this woman who had been a, um, an activist and a friend and a trustworthy person who became a betrayer and a danger. And they were really sensitive to what their needs were and what their problems were. And, and then finally, I was, I, was, I was really amazed at the way that Christians were not only just having me in their home because it was Sunday afternoon, but the regular way that people's homes were open and the things that people were telling me that they were, you know, strangely enough, learning from me. I was amazed that people allowed me to take my place as an image bearer of a holy God and as a newly crafted woman of God and to be a helper. I mean, they were small things and they were big things, but I was allowed to bake bread for my pastor's wife. I was, I was involved and, and embraced, and that was really powerful. But mostly what amazed me was nobody said, wow, now that you're a Christian, I hope we can just be done with all this lesbian stuff and we can just get on with the business of getting you married off and getting you all cleaned up and getting you, you know, safely packaged in a way that we can recognize. No, that was not what my church did. My church was willing to meet me, meet me right where I was at and nurture me and love me in the Lord from there. And I learned that the biggest sin in my life was unbelief, not homosexuality. I learned that Jesus... Uh, that Jesus, the blood of Jesus covered the sin not only of my uh, enormous legacy of sexual uh, lust and other things, but also my tepid relationship to the Bible. And, um, and I just fell in love more and more with Jesus and with his church because of the way that Christians could stand with me and weep with me and walk with me not think that suddenly I was going to be all cleaned up. Because you know what? They weren't all cleaned up either. Well, if you know the story of Rosaria Butterfield, you know it started with an editorial she wrote in the newspaper. And it was an editorial defending uh, gay and lesbian lifestyles. And, and uh, she received a ton of mail after that editorial hit the newspaper. And she was putting the mail in two stacks. Stack one was all those who thanked her and were very supportive of her letter. All the, uh, the other stack was people who were very angry with her and expressed hatred, really, toward her. And then she had this one letter in the middle. Uh, someone who didn't agree with her perspective, but whose letter was very kind, very thoughtful, very compassionate, uh, treated her with gentleness and respect, and she ended up connecting with this pastor of this church that she was just describing, and they welcomed her into their home. And she was very much, that moment when she first sat down at their table, like Matthew, who's in the text today. She was a modern Matthew. And that pastor and his wife treated her the way Jesus treated Matthew. And from there, she became a Christian. She entered into the church, but she was still, her life was messy, as she described, and that church treated her with grace and compassion and understood that uh, when people come to Christ, it's not like their life is instantly cleaned up and everything's in order, and we need to give each other time and grace, and that's what she experienced. And that's what we're called to here in our text as we look at Mark chapter 2 and the story of Jesus' encounter with Matthew, and the point really here is that people's lives are messy. The neighbors we're called to love in the course of this series are not people whose lives are all cleaned up. They're not necessarily disciplined, thoughtful, organized, others-centered, serving kinds of people. Uh, the people we're called to love may be wounded, dysfunctional, immature, self-centered, hard to understand, Strong opinions, very different from ours. I mean, those are the kinds of people that we're being called to love. People who have a different perspective, a different worldview. In fact, people who really, if we were entirely honest with them and they were entirely honest with us, their opinions and worldviews would probably even 
shock us, unnerve us if we really knew all that they thought or maybe all that they had done. If we're going to love our neighbors, we're going to have to immerse ourselves in a world of the people here that are called sinners. That's how the Pharisees looked at them in our text today. And the story begins with Jesus calling Matthew, who's also called Levi. Levi and Matthew are the same person. Uh, they, he becomes a disciple of Christ, ends up writing the first gospel, the gospel of Matthew. But at the time Jesus encounters him, it's very different. The text tells us that uh, Matthew was a tax collector. Now, I suppose even today, if the IRS calls you, <laughs> you know, uh, the IRS agent may have a certain stigma attached, but nothing like a tax collector in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, to be a tax collector, there were two different levels of taxes. There were taxes that were kind of fixed, like the poll tax, which everybody paid, and and the tax you paid on your, your grain, you, you had to pay a tenth as a tax. Or the tax you paid on your income, it was a 1% tax. But then there were these tax collectors that uh, the Romans would um, farm out the tax collecting job to somebody local. And those tax weren't very well defined. Nobody exactly knew what the taxes were or weren't. And the, the tax collectors could collect them quite arbitrarily and at any time. They could even come up to you, you're pulling your cart along with, the, with bundles on the cart, and they could stop you, they could look through the bundles and say, oh no, you, pay, you owe a tax on this, oh, you've got a cart, it has two wheels, you have to pay a per wheel tax, and the tax is this. <laughs> if you couldn't pay, they'd say, well, I'll tell you what, I will loan you the money that you owe <laughs> at a quite exorbitant rate, and it was, it was levied in a way that was harsh, that was arbitrary. And the tax collectors themselves, the only way they made money was to charge higher taxes than what the Romans expected. And this was the way the system was set up. They charged whatever they wanted, and whatever they had to pay the Romans went to the Romans, and the rest was theirs to keep. And these were some of the wealthiest people in every village were the tax collectors who just kept charging higher and higher taxes to line their pockets more and more. And they, they were robbers, really. In fact, that's how they were referred to in the Mishnah. They were called robbers. It was extortion. It was graft. It was exploitation. That's, that's what a tax collector was. They were seen as rich, despicable vermin because also they were traitors. Because Matthew is a Jew, but he's betraying his own people as the servant of the oppressive Roman Empire, collecting these taxes from his own people. He was hated and despised, probably the most hated and despised person in that place where Matthew lived. And of all the people that Jesus could have called as a disciple, he comes to Matthew at his tax booth and says, you, follow me. And Matthew gets up and he leaves everything and he follows Jesus. Now, it's, it, it would be equivalent to um, a, a, a Nazi collaborator all of a sudden coming into the church and wanting to be accepted or, or a communist informer all of a sudden who's been betraying church people and, and informing to the authorities about who believes in Jesus and should be arrested. And all of a sudden they come into the church and say, hey, I want to be accepted by you. That's who Matthew was, this corrupt, money-loving traitor. And his friends, of course, were all of the same caste, lived on the fringe of society. And so for Jesus to immerse himself in this world of Matthew and his friends was to bring ridicule and scorn. And that's exactly what happens, of course. The, the Pharisees can't begin to understand what Jesus, the Jewish rabbi, is doing here. And so they ask... Uh, Ask the others, what, what's going on here? Why would Jesus do this? Why is Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners? They are unclean, doesn't he realize? It's a mess to get involved in their lives. You get tainted when you associate with these folks. Why does he do this? And he's scorned and mocked by the powers that be in the society and the principal ruling and spiritual authorities. 
And from this picture, I just want to draw a few principles this morning, and you've got them in your bulletin or on your, on your app. First principle to apply is, seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? We are to be a friend to sinners. Jesus is a friend to sinners here. In both his calling of Matthew and feasting with his friends, Jesus shows himself to be this friend of sinners. In fact, he names them as his mission. He said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. They are my focus. They are my ministry. Throughout Jesus' ministry, we see him not focusing on the rich, the powerful, the influential, the powers that be, the respectful in society. He's with the lowly, he's with the outcast, he's with the lame, the blind, the poor, those who live on the fringes of society. He goes to and loves people where they are. The text seems to emphasize that in the way it's worded here when he goes out to them, as Ben mentioned earlier, the, the fortress, <laughs> not sitting over here waiting for you, but going out to us. That's what Jesus does. He goes where they are and meets them as they are and builds relational bridges to people in need. This is the scandal of grace here. Love for the undeserving. Mercy to those in misery. And so if we're people of grace, we call ourselves Grace Community Church. If we're people of grace, our love will overcome challenges and obstacles and will be lavished upon as we immerse ourselves in the worst forms of human depravity. So the question is, who is there in your life? What friend, what co-worker, what classmate, what neighbor, what family member whose opinions or decisions or actions maybe even disgust you, make them challenging to be around? How would Jesus have responded to them? And are we a friend to sinners? Second, we should be immune to needing the approval of others. Jesus doesn't care what the Pharisees think here. It's a scandal to them as he sits and eats with those unclean. But just as he does with the woman at the well, just as he does with Zacchaeus, just as he does with Mary Magdalene, so he does here with Levi, he's quite willing to, to cross cultural boundaries that he knows are scandalous. He's quite willing to tear down barriers that society has built up, and it doesn't matter what society thinks about that. Jesus will cross those boundaries. He will tear down those barriers. Once we decide to love unconditionally, we risk the scorn and alienation of others. If you choose as a student to sit in the lunchroom with that student who everybody else lets sit alone because they're an outcast, they're a reject, there's something about them that makes everybody else, holds them at arm's length, and you go with your plate or your bag and you sit down with them and are with them. You are next to them when nobody else will be. Well, there's a certain cost to that maybe. If you are willing to talk to and treat kindly the coworker who's really the the thorn in the side of everybody in your office place. So you're willing to extend yourself to your family member that everybody else has cast aside and rejected. There's a cost to crossing those boundaries. But we are God-pleasers, not men-pleasers. Our only desire is to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. And we will cross whatever barriers love calls us to cross in his service, loving those he loves. Third, we should recognize the value of the table. Now, we're going to talk about this more in two weeks, the, the table and hospitality. But you see Jesus at Matthew's table and feasting. It says reclining. You know, it's kind of like you've seen this maybe in the movies in a, where, where the, there's a table in Japan and the table's this high, you know, and they're all down there at the table. That's how it was in Jesus' day. The table was low and you reclined at table. And here's Jesus reclining with them and feasting with them, with those that everyone else saw as sinners. But this is not the exception. This is at the center of Jesus' mission, and so it should be with us. To, this, this eating with them is a symbol of acceptance. In the first century, it, it, it symbolized identification with 
It symbolized solidarity with those you reclined with at table. Like when Jesus, uh, you know, saw Zacchaeus, the wee little man up on the tree. <laughs> Zacchaeus, uh, when Jesus says, I'm coming to your house today. That's a big deal in the first century. I am going to come and I'm going to sit and I'm going to eat with you in solidarity with you, in identification with you. I want to be in relationship with you. Fellowship. I want to know and be known by you. It's clear that Jesus is glad to be with these people. This wasn't just his job. It wasn't just his mission. It's his delight to be at table with them. In fact, in uh, Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, Jesus says of himself, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, here's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And <laughs> Jesus is quite willing to be known that way. And part of what the table tells us here is people are not projects to be fixed, but people to be enjoyed. Men, <laughs> You sit at the table with your wife and she's telling you the story of her day. Uh, she's not a project to be fixed. <laughs> Don't just, just listen, just nod your head, ask good questions. Uh, she's a person to be delighted in and enjoyed there at the table with her. And that's how Jesus treated everybody. People to be enjoyed. Relationship, acceptance, pleasure in their presence. That's, that's what the table represents here. And fourthly, we should be motivated by compassion. We have the same story told in two other Gospels. And each of them adds just a little more to the story that I think is helpful. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, that I put it in there? Yeah. Um, go and learn what this means. It's the same incident. And uh, you see, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. But just before it, Jesus also said, but Mark, for his purposes, didn't record, I desire mercy or compassion, depending on your translation, and not sacrifice. What Jesus wants is your heart, not your good deeds. Love flowing from the heart, a love of compassion. The table is a place of compassion. It's a place of acceptance, a place of transparency, a place of openness, a place of receptivity where a person can come and be without fear of rejection. That's what Rosario Butterfield feared. This rejection because her life was messy. It wasn't all cleaned up and she had all these responsibilities and connections and her, the, her life was going to take quite some time to get organized and straightened out. And yet these people said, come and eat with us anyway. Come and be a part of us anyway. We're going to give you grace. We're going to give you time to get it all figured out. We're going to accept you as you are. That's what the table says, and that's what compassion does. Jesus isn't in a hurry here. Like, okay, check. I had to call Matthew. Let's get on to the... Okay, Matthew's friends. i got to spend a little time with... Jesus isn't looking at his watch. This is Jesus in relationships of love with these people. That's who he is. His heart flows in compassion with them. He could look past the differences, the irritations, the frustrations, the dysfunctions, and by grace, he entered into their lives. That's what, that's what pictured for us here. He earned the trust of others, not looking at his watch, but into their eyes. We should enjoy people. We should listen to them. We should discover their needs, their wounds, their fears, their concerns, their disappointments. Hear their stories as we care for them because we are God's hands and feet to them. We are to be with them and we are to be there for them. Fifth, we should be motivated by gospel goals. Now on the one hand, as I said, they aren't projects, they are people. Our relationships should be unconditional, agendaless friendships. We want to genuinely know them, love them, care for them as they are, reach out to them. Most of us have experienced what I've experienced more than once. You know, you get a, you get a call from somebody or a, a text or a message, hey, let's have lunch. Oh, that sounds great. You know, you, you show up at the restaurant or the coffee shop quite ready for a 
conversation and to spend some time with a friend, and it turns out they have an agenda. <laughs> they wanted something. They had a purpose for this meal, and it was something that was going to serve them. They weren't really interested in you. They wanted something from you. You don't get that from Jesus at all. He's not wanting something from them. It's, it's an agendaless relationship. Love doesn't come across that way. We're all in relationship with other image bearers of God, as Rosaria called them. We are in relationship with them because of love and compassion for the sake of relationship. But ultimately, their needs are spiritual, and only when they are transformed from the inside out can they truly flourish. We understand that. We have to be patient with them. We have to approach those spiritual needs in the Lord's time, but we do understand that they have deeper spiritual needs, and until those needs are met, their life will really never be different. And in Luke's gospel, did I put it in there? Yeah, Luke chapter 5, Luke says at the end of this same story, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Ultimately, Jesus' mission is to help them acknowledge that the root issues are sin issues, and until they get those resolved and forgiven in relationship with him, their lives will never be changed. That church in relationship with Rosario Butterfield, of course, on the one hand, they're gracious and accepting and, and welcoming and patient, but on the other hand, they had goals, which was to lead her to Christ and to help her conform to Christ. Of course, that's our goal and purpose here, isn't it? to bring people to Christ and help them grow in relationship and in conformity to Christ. That's, that's who we are. That's what we do. That's what love does. Introduce people to the one who can meet their needs, satisfy their desires, and fashion them into the person that God originally intended them to be. So we love, we listen, and in God's time, we join him in what he's doing in their life as his ambassadors beseeching the world to be reconciled to God. Uh, Greg Finke, in his couple chapters on this subject, says there are two questions we should ask every day. You get up, two questions. One, Jesus, what are you up to in the lives of those I encounter today? So you're off to school, you're off to work, wherever you're going. Jesus, what are you up to in the lives of those I'm going to encounter today? Question two, how can I join you in what you're doing in their lives? What are you up to, Jesus? How can I join you in it? And joining him in the work he's doing may be as simple as an encouraging word. It may be as simple as some practical physical assistance in some way, a meal or helping a neighbor with a project or whatever it might be. It might be just a listening ear. They want want to tell their story to somebody. They want somebody to understand. They want somebody to sympathize. It might be just putting your hand on their shoulder after they've told you their story and saying, could I just pray for a moment with you about that right now? You know, I almost never had anybody turn me down. It really doesn't matter whether church people are unchurched, where they're from, who they are. You say, would, would you mind if I just pray with you about that right now? Very simple way to change the whole nature of the moment and people receive it and it's a way you can enter into their situation and join God in what he's doing in their life. And then lastly, we should be motivated by the reality that we're a mess as well. Our lives are a mess. We are sinners in need of grace. Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. Those who are well have no need of a physician. That's meant to be a rebuke to these Pharisees who see themselves as well and have no need for a Savior because they're not sick. When they call these other people sinners, that word for sinners means wicked. That means lawbreakers. That means people who are far from God in contrast to us who are very close to God. Thank you very much. In fact, Quoting Rabbi Meyer, the Mishnah states this of these religious leaders. 
He that occupies himself in the study of the law is deserving of the whole world. He is called friend, beloved of God, lover of God, lover of mankind, and it clothes him with humility and reverence and fits him to become righteous, saintly, upright, and faithful, and it keeps him far from sin and brings him near to virtue, and from him men enjoy counsel and sound knowledge and understanding and might. Now, I hope if I ever said as your pastor, well, I as the one who brings the law and the gospel to you, uh, I, I'm deserving of the whole world. Uh, I am clothed with humility and reverence. And I hope you would laugh at me <laughs> uh, if I ever spoke like that about myself. But they were serious. That's how these religious leaders saw themselves. They were well they were righteous. They didn't need a Savior. And the truth is, Revelation chapter 3, I say, if you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiable, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. It's like the great Oz, you know. <laughs> oh, the great and, great and terrible Oz. And, and the curtain gets pulled back, and it's just this little man back there. We all need the curtain pulled back. We all need to be seen for who we are. And we are sinners in need of a Savior. We are among the sick, sinful, needy. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're all messed up sinners in need of grace, in need of love, in need of redemption. Paul himself was a self-righteous Pharisee who then eventually said, I consider all my righteousness as filthy rags. I need Jesus. I only want to know him. Paul says in Timothy, this is a trustworthy and, deserves, and statement full, deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I'm the chief. I mean, unless we're willing to say that, really, we're not going to be caring about others or look, looking at, at others in any other way other than a self-righteous, judgmental way, looking down our nose at them from our, you know, our high tower of righteousness. It's only when we realize that we're needy sinners just like them that we will have compassion on them and first be moved to reach them. Only if we recognize that we've been rescued by God will we have any desire and love and care to be a rescuer to others. So do we see ourselves as we really are? Sinners in need of a Savior. Nicholas Kristof is an editorialist for the New York Times. Nicholas is no friend of evangelical Christianity. In fact, in this article, in his own words, he says he disagrees strongly with most evangelical Christians theologically and politically. Yet he wrote this editorial about evangelical Christian work primarily in Mozambique, and he writes that the article is entitled God on Their Side. And he had seen the work that evangelical Christians were doing in Africa. And he tells the story of this Sonia Angeline who was in one of these big garbage dumps. And maybe you've seen them on the news or TV and these people who live in the, the dumps. And here was this young lady, 17 years old and pregnant. And she'd been in delivery four days. There was something wrong. And she, was, she and the baby were about to die. And 23-year-old Katrin Blackard, who was there as, as a volunteer with Iris Ministries, found her in the dump in this case and paid her taxi fare to get her to the hospital so that she could deliver this child and both she and the child were, their lives were saved. And it's just one story of the kinds of things that Nicholas Kristof had seen of evangelical Christians. So after seeing this kinds of things, he says, I'm forced to conclude, I'm convinced that if we that we should celebrate the big evangelical push into Africa 
Because the bottom line is it will mean more orphanages, more schools, and above all, more clinics, more hospitals, more good, more compassion, more care, more needs met if the evangelical Christians are there. Now, what about the people in our life? What about the Boone community in our church? Would they say, wow, I don't, I don't think much of their politics. I certainly don't think much of their views on sexuality or marriage. But wow, this would not be the same place if they weren't here. There'd be less compassion. There'd be less care. There'd be less hope. There'd be more brokenness if they weren't here. Would, would our circle of influence say that about us? Would, would the city of Boone miss anything if Grace Community Church weren't here? Would they realize that there's less hope, there's more brokenness, there are fewer needs met because we weren't here? Do they see that there's value because of the way we love and we care and we are the hands and feet of Christ reaching those in need in our community? Because that's what Jesus did. And that's what Jesus calls us to, is to love sinners be a friend of sinners just like him. So let's just bow in a moment of prayer and you ask God how he would have you respond. Who, who are the Matthews in your life? How he would have you respond. And then I'll close in prayer. Father, we acknowledge to you that we're a mess. We were lost, hopeless, sinful, wounded, needy, and you rescued us. We bless you, give you the glory, thank you and praise you, recognizing nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And we see those around us with those eyes, that they are also Helpless, hopeless, lost, broken, wounded, needy. And that it's us you're sending as ambassadors to reach them, help them, lift them up, rescue them. And so give us the eyes of Christ to see those around us as he sees them. And let us be the hands of Christ as we go to minister to those needs. Thank you for grace that has been lavished on us. Let us be so rich, so overflowing in the grace that has first been poured out on us. We pray to your glory. Amen.